you said, is Lynn Womack. I'm a forest health specialist for Georgia Forestry Commission. Um, we are the state agency with the mission of protecting our forest resources. And within there, we are divided into um, wildfire control and forest management. We actually have a forest health group of four across the state dealing with all the forest health issues we have in Georgia. I'm the one who has been tasked with Emerald Ash Borer mostly because I work in the northern part of the state and that is where we first got it and where it has kind of continued to, to stay for right now. Um, so moving along, we will talk about Emerald Ash Borer and, and what's gone on with the history of it, mostly the history in Georgia since that's where I am and a lot of you guys are in the southeast and then we'll talk about also some of the control things that have been done uh, across the United States. So it is a metallic wood boring beetle. Its Latin name is Agrylus planipennis. It is native to China, Korea, and Russia. And uh, we do have lots of native ash borers in the United States. They are usually do not attack our healthy ash trees. Most ash borers are kind of looking at trees that are already in decline. So that's kind of the biggest difference is that emerald ash borer attacks healthy living trees. Uh, from what we know of its history, it was accidentally introduced into Michigan in the mid 1990s. We can't exactly pinpoint that, but um, they believe it was brought in on solid wood packing material. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about the bio biology of the insect and why that's important. So they first found it and identified it in 2002. It actually took them a little while to figure out what it was. The people in Michigan thought that it was some sort of a disease that was killing their trees. And finally, somebody was actually able to do some branch sampling and came up with some larvae. And, some, and it got sent kind of around the world in a year's time for people to try to identify it because there wasn't that much information on it because it wasn't a pest in its native region. So once they identified it and figured out what it was, it had already become well-established and widespread and control methods really didn't work. Um, the insect itself, they've done some, some studies that the male can fly about one mile a year and the female can fly about three miles per year. So clearly in the amount of time from 2002 until present with it getting all the way down into Georgia and Alabama, something else has been moving it along. Uh, and that would be humans. So with the, we, uh, it can move in any sort of ash materials, be that logs, firewood, nursery stock, mulch, um, if it's not small enough. We'll talk about those sorts of treating, uh, treatment options for ash materials also. Um, it, historically, we thought it only attacks North American ash trees. So we, they're not resistant to it like the trees in its native areas of China and Russia in Asia. Um, we don't have their native predators either. There has been some research in the Midwest on white fringe tree and that it, it can survive and reproduce in white fringe tree, but that's also an area with really high EAB populations and about 99% of their ash trees have died. So it might be a little bit more site specific and that's what we know about it right now. I think they're still doing some research to understand how many of those fringe trees may be um, attacked. To date, emerald ash borer has destroyed hundreds of millions of ash trees uh, across the range of where it has been found. And that has cost upwards of hundreds of millions of dollars to those towns and municipalities, property owners, nursery operators, and the forest product industry. Um, they say that emerald ash borer is going to be as devastating as chestnut blight and Dutch elm disease, and that to date, Forest Service says that it's the most destructive and costly forest insect that we have had in the United States. Um, this is a graphic and it's actually an interactive graphic and I very much encourage you to visit, visit the website emeraldashborer.info. Um, like I said, this is interactive and there's a scroll bar at the bottom and you can scroll it back to 2002 and then move it all the way along to 2019. And you can see the explosion of the population of emerald ash borer and where it has been found. So now for the biology of the insect, when we talk about kind of the, how much impact this insect can have, it's really important to understand the biology and how it works and, and how it is that it's killing our ash trees. So this is a graphic of the life cycle of emerald ash borer. I like to start 
in the bottom right hand corner in the early spring. And so for those of us in the southeast, um, this is kind of what's going on right now. These insects have the larvae have pupated and they're hanging out under the bark in their little tunnel staying not, not too cold in the northern areas, but when it hits a certain number of growing degree days, which is the magic number, I think it's somewhere between 400 and 450, they um, emerge as, their, as the adult insect. The adult insects then feed on the leaves of the ash trees for about two weeks. I think the females may feed lar longer. They lay their eggs in the bark crevices on the outside of the tree, anywhere from 50 to 100 eggs per female insect. Those eggs take between a week and two weeks to hatch. So at this point, if we say that in Georgia, let's say middle Georgia, the adult insects emerge on April 1st, which is pretty typical here in Georgia. We're now at about May 1st for the eggs hatching and becoming larvae. The larvae then feed on the bark underneath the tree for the rest of the summer. Um, these larvae go through four instars and um, then when it hits a certain amount of cold um, days, they then start to pupate. I know in some areas, nor some of the northern areas and the, um, in the Midwest and some in Michigan, they think that this insect might actually have a two-year life cycle. Those um, summer days are shortened. The number of summer days where those larvae have to feed and go through all of their instars are, are less. So they might take them two years as um, feeding as larvae to then pupate. So there's a lot of information out there since the insect was first found in the Midwest. Most of the research has been in Michigan, Ohio, Indiana. And we think that it actually behaves much different in the South than it does in the North. So a lot of times with the research we have is slightly different for those of us in the Southern states. Um, you guys, I know some of you were from up in the in Michigan. I, I can't remember exactly where she said your locations were, but the, um, the very southernmost border of Georgia has already hit the growing degree days to be at peak emergence for emerald ash borer, and it's just now March 1st. So I know that's very different than you guys. Um, so here's the larvae. It um, feeds and creates its larval galleries underneath the bark. And this is the stage that does the damage, the most amount of damage to these trees. The adult beetles do do some feeding on the leaves, but it's not enough to really damage the tree, especially at that time of year. The larval um, form of this insect, stage of this insect, feeds and creates enough galleries that it um, slows the flow of nutrients and water in the phloem of the tree. And um, basically, Basically, when you get enough of these larval galleries all the way around the tree, it ends up girdling it. Um, research has shown that emerald ash borer actually has visual cues for finding ash trees in the landscape and that um, it flies above the trees and can identify specifically ash trees. So that's why, one, it's hard to detect these populations until they move further down into the tree. So they have been there for a fair number of years, usually before you detect them. And that's also why the tree usually kind of dies from the top down. This is one um, of the good ways to, to notice that possibly you have emerald ash borer, you have this crown thinning. They have started feeding and laying their eggs in the tops of those branches and they're slowly moving their way down. You can see some epicormic sprouting at the base of the tree. This is also a sign that the tree is uh, under stress. So usually by the time you get to this point, you will start seeing those signs of emerald ash borer down the stem of the tree, and you can start looking for things like these bark splits. As those larval galleries start to form and crisscross and start girdling the tree, the green part under the bark starts to separate and dry out. And if you find these splits, this is where you can start, is really an easy place to start peeling the bark off. In this instance, I found um, these trees were pretty heavily infested and I found the D-shaped exit hole. Uh, a specific, the D-shape of these exit holes is specific to emerald ash borer. All of our native ash borers have a round exit hole. It can be oriented in any direction, but I will tell you in areas that we know we have emerald ash borer you, and it's relatively new, you can go out and look for D-shaped exit holes and it is very much like looking for a needle in a haystack, you very rarely find them. 
um, unless it's just to the point where the trees are already dead. So in this instance, I cut the bark out and there was a perfect gallery underneath. Um, if you started at the top of the screen and worked your way down, you can see that as the larvae is feeding, he's growing and going through all of his instars. When you get to the bottom, he makes his turn back up to the top. And in the very middle of the screen in the dark spot is where he pupated and then emerged out right in that hole in the middle there would be aligned up with the D-shaped exit hole where he emerged as an adult insect. This is what the adult insect looks like. You've seen the pictures. It's a beautiful beetle. It's hard for everybody, you know, to think it can be so destructive when it looks nice. They are easily identified. Um, there are some other ones out there that look like this. It has green overwings. It has the nice red and gold under his wings. He actually also has a gold belly it is one of the ways that when I find them on my traps, I can identify them. And there on the right, you can see them emerging from their D-shaped exit holes. Um, this is how quickly some of the destruction can happen. These, is, these are pictures from a streetscape in Ohio in 2006 where they're just starting to become invested with emerald ash borer and with doing nothing. By 2009, you can see that all of these trees have died from emerald ash borer. Um, this is pretty devastating for areas like Ohio that probably went through this same thing in um, the 60s and 70s with Dutch elm disease and they lost all of their elm trees and then came back through and planted ash and now all of their ash have died. Um, so that's what it looks like in urban areas. This is an area in Wisconsin. I hope this picture shows up clear enough. Uh, you can see all the dead stems in these forested natural areas. Those are all ash. Uh, from the air in Georgia, I have seen a small amount of damage. Most of it is in our low-lying areas because that's where we find ash. Here in Georgia, only about 1% of our forested areas are ash, so there's not that much of it. And where we do find it, it's there's a lot of it, but those populations of ash are spread out further. So Again, another thing, we don't have con lots of continuous forests of ash trees for this EAB to move from one place to another. And it might be kind of slowing its spread because it takes it longer to find one from one ash tree um, population or ecosystem to the next. Um, so in Georgia, since the start of, of all of this, we didn't start trapping until 2005 when we knew how rapidly emerald ash borer could move. We first detected it in Georgia in July of 2013, and that was by traps, by the purple prism traps. And it was detected in DeKalb and Fulton counties. For those of you not familiar with Florida, DeKalb and Fulton counties are the two smack dab metro counties in the middle of Atlanta. We do know that in 2012, it was found in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is right one on the first county border between Tennessee and Georgia. There's about 100 miles between Chattanooga and Atlanta, and, and, and so we found that it skipped that jump. Georgia was the 21st state in the United States to find emerald ash borer. EAB can now be found in 35 states and five Canadian provinces, providences, and in Georgia we have found it in 26 counties. So emerald ash, why is this important? Well, we know how destructive it can be. And because of this, it has become a federally regulated um, species. I must have lost a slide in there. Sorry about that, it happens. So emerald ash borer is a federally regulated species. There, this is the slide that I meant to have. I'll have to go back. Um, what does that mean? It means, and what is regulated? So it means that any material that could possibly harbor emerald ash borer should be regulated. Um, and that means quarantine. And so that includes on any of these materials that anything that could have emerald ash borer, any life stage of emerald ash borer, logs, lumber, chip mulch, hardwood mulch, chips, wood packing material, nursery stock, and all hardwood firewood. So mulch and firewood are not distinguished by species because at that level you can't tell what it is. Um, the possibility with, we talked about larvae feeding under the bark, that's why logs can't be moved. And um, because if you move them from place to place in the winter time, and then we get to those degree days and those EAB emerge. You can now move them to a new place. Same with wood packing material. Anything that has the bark left on it has the potential for those um, larvae and pupae to be left underneath the material and then they can emerge 
the following spring. Nursery stock, of course, could have it on there also. So now I have to skip back up to my slides. Um, so we, we have both levels of quarantine, both at the federal and the state level. Here in Georgia, the Emerald Ash Borer was regulated by both the Department of Agriculture and the Forestry Commission. Of course, Department of Agriculture did the urban areas, Forestry Commission did the forested areas, and anything that was gonna leave the quarantine area had to be treated to be pest-free and have a certificate. Um, so things like mulch. So mulch had to be one inch by one inch in two dimensions. It can be long and skinny as long as it fit through our one inch sieve here. And the idea behind that was that one, that the mulching process could um, destroy any insects in the material. But the other idea is that that material is small enough that it dries out fast enough that EAB cannot survive in, those, in that material. Um, we did have where during certain times of year, loggers could get a limited permit to move logs out of the quarantine area um, and that we worked very closely with them because they were done in the winter time to an area where they were processed before the ability, before we got those growing degree days when they would emerge from the logs. Um, so this is kind of the peak of our trapping activities here in Georgia. In 2013, we found it, and those gray counties are DeKalb and Fulton County. All of the trapping and through to, to 2017 was done by contractors funded through USDA APHIS and their program. You can see this is 1,244 traps. They had a whole protocol trying to find the high, the areas, the risk map that where they could high important area, areas to hang their traps. So we move along to 2016 and you can see we've added a fair number of counties and the traps have been spread further out throughout the state because we've been, we think that it's moving more. And then we moved to 2017. If you notice, none of the green, con the green maps were hung by contractors, the green dots, the red dots were hung by GFC staff. In 2016, we went to a regional quarantine. So the Northern part of the state was quarantined and the Southern part was not. Once an area goes under quarantine, USDA no longer funds for those with initial detection for those trapping. So, um, since we had a regional quarantine, we still had areas that did not have emerald ash borer, but that were quarantined that the USDA APHIS did not trap in. So we did those with some GFC personnel with the limited number of staff that we have. And, um, and this is when in 2017, South Carolina had their first detection of emerald ash borer, ash borer in the very Northwest part of South Carolina, which is adjacent to the Northeast corner of Georgia and all of eastern Tennessee has been quarantined by this point. So movement of wood north and south between Tennessee and also North Carolina is free. And Alabama has a very small regional quarantine just adjacent to ours on the west side of Georgia. And South Carolina in 2017 found EAB in three counties and they went ahead and went with a statewide quarantine, which meant that our entire eastern border with South Carolina was under quarantine and the rest of South Georgia was not. So in 2017, we moved to a statewide quarantine even though we only had emerald ash borer in the about 23 counties in the northern part of the state. So once we went with a statewide quarantine, USDA APHIS doesn't fund trapping in those areas. So in 2018, we had to do this just with GFC personnel. We tried to put these in high importance areas, both at state parks and around hardwood sawmills. And we added three more counties in the northern part of the state. And this brings us up to date. Um, and we have 26 counties in Georgia that have emerald ash borer, still under a statewide quarantine. Uh, most of Alabama does not have a quarantine and Florida does not have a quarantine. So any of those wood products moving there have to have um, a certificate from USDA to move this material. Uh, this is what it looks like on a large scale. The blue line is the federal quarantine line. You can see um, the little bit of a quarantine that Alabama has to our west, but everything to the north and to the east, all those wood products flow freely. Um, in October of 2018, USDA APHIS had a motion to deregulate emerald ash borer. Um, this means that they think that it's gotten to the point that the regulation is not worth putting the money into, basically. 
And um, those comments have now closed and their comments are under review and they have not created a final ruling on that yet. But basically what that means is a lot of the funding will be gone. Um, probably they will not be trapping anymore. And most of their funding will move to biological control. And uh, for places like Georgia, who we only have emerald ash borer in the top third of our state and most of our neighboring states do not have emerald ash borer, it's kind of, kind of disappointing because we feel like we owe it to our landowners in the state to know where this insect is so that they can be proactive, they can start treating, they can, if they have ash stands that they have been managing, for lumber that are part of their retirement or part of their kids college that they are able to to know that this pest is within range of, of affecting them and do what they need to do so gfc will continue to be trapping for emerald ash borer even if they deregulate this it means that the quarantine will go away but we will still be following and tracking its location in georgia so on to what does that mean with biological control? Biological control is the use of another insect in this case to control the, the, the pest. Um, here they're using two, actually they're using parasitic wasps that attack two phases of the insect, one being the eggs and one being the larvae. And their goal of this biological control program is to lower the survival of those emerald ash borer eggs and larvae. Um, by establishing these parasitic wasps. And then with those parasitoids, they, um, in combination with things like some possibilities of tree resistance, woodpecker predation, and attacking by native parasitoids, they'll be able to reduce EAB densities and lower the number of attacks per tree so that some of these ash trees can survive. Um, this research first began in 2007. There are still some labs in Michigan that are, are releasing these wasps. Um, they did their research. They traveled to the areas in China and Russia where they know that emerald ash borer is from. They look at the native ash trees there and they try to find what it is that is keeping emerald ash borer in check so that their trees aren't declining. And um, from that, originally they found three parasitic wasps that they brought back to the US um, and with USDA research, um, one species that specifically attacks the eggs and two that attack the larval form. And then they, by 2015, they found that one of those original ones that was attacking the larval form of the EAB um, really didn't produce well and, and it really wasn't surviving well in the wild. So in 2015, they went back and found a fourth parasitoid um, that also attacks the larval phase of emerald ash borer. Um, there's a really good document. Again, this is, um, if you go to emeraldashborer.info and in the search box, you type in biocontrol, this document is there. For those of you in the northern parts of the US, this is a lot of information that can be very pertinent to you probably not as pertinent to, uh, to those of us in Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, but it's a lot to learn from. Um, and I wouldn't, I, I got these graphs from that publication. And basically what it shows is that this one shows that from their introductions in 2007, this is on EAB larvae, that the um, parasitism rate has been increasing slowly but surely over time. You can see there's some pretty big jumps from 460. Well, don't worry about the numbers. Basically, it's the trend that there's a higher parasitism right now on EAB larvae than there was without any releases of the biocontrols. And then also, they have been founding lower numbers of EAB larvae um, per when they do these, when they look at the, the bark under the bark of these trees. So the parasitoids are doing their job. Um, they're definitely helping. Uh, they have shown that the newest one that they released in 2015 should be establishing itself quickly in the northeastern and northern U.S. and that by um, the smaller ash trees can be protected by the two, two of the parasitoids that they originally released, uh, which are starting to now allow ash regeneration. So what happens is and this is where we haven't figured this out for Georgia. In areas with a lot of ash, the EAB population is gonna climb and, and 
start growing rapidly and then all the large ash trees are going to die and the EAB populations are going to crash to some point and then this is where we're going to start allowing ash regeneration. EAB is never going to go away. Um, so bring now bringing in these parasitoids in areas with um, lower amounts of emerald ash borer, we're going to start to allow the ash regeneration. The other part of doing these biocontrol releases is that <clears throat> you have to have an area that has enough of an emerald ash borer population to support the parasitoid, the biocontrol population also. So in Georgia where emerald ash borer is newer, we only got it in 2013 versus 2002 in Michigan, our emerald ash borer populations in most areas are not high enough to carry a population of parasitic wasps. So that's one part of it and I'll talk about that second part in a minute. But Allowing these small ash trees to regenerate means that in another five to ten years they'll be larger and then we're back to the other biocontrol of S. gallinae to help control with the larvae in those species. Um, what they're learning um, since 2007, so a little over 10 years, uh, they've been released in 26 states. 17 of those states have been able to go back to those areas that they released them and found that these parasit parasitic wasps um, have become established. Um, we talked about region and, and the biology of EAB here in the south. Um, so now, last 2017, not, not long ago, they finally began doing work um, in southern China at a latitude that can be close to that of mid Florida to find natural ash stands and find some potentially matching parasitoids for those southern states um, like Louisiana, Florida, Alabama then they also are in the process of starting research for those western states that have a much different climate than the northeastern states. So what else can be done? Of course, parasitoids are used on a larger landscape level, which people like me in, in forestry are looking at the landscape level, but then we have the individual homeowners in the urban areas that are looking more at individual tree levels at the park level, not at the hundreds of acre level. So what we can do in those aspects really depends on your location and your budget and your goal. And part of that also and, um, depends on how long emerald ash borer has been in your area, how many ash trees you have, things like that. So one of the biggest things to know is, is, is how much emerald ash borer is in my area. So they say that insecticide controls are worth doing once you know that emerald ash borer is within about five miles of your location. Um, those of you who already know that you have emerald ash borer, then it kind of comes down to how healthy are my trees. And so in this picture is a really great kind of, um, they say that that 30% of crown dieback is that cutoff point to make it a tree worth saving. And so that has to do with how much live material and if the, the the main tree stem and, and apial bud is still alive and if that tree can recover. So if you're 30% or less crown thinning, then we're good. We can, we can start to think about what kind of a method we want to do to protect these trees. Once you get to crown dieback of 50%, it's really not worth investing the money. Um, it's time to cut it down and replant. Uh, the other thing about ash trees, leaving them alone and letting them die, especially in urban areas, is they become very brittle very fast and become very much of a hazard tree in areas where you have people. In a forested area, it's fine. If there's something that are along a trail, it's definitely something that you wanna think about removing before it dies. Even at 50% dieback of these larger trees, that's a lot of large branches that could be falling on trails and on people. Um, so definitely something to think about and put in your budget. Um, I watched a webinar the other day and he has, in Indiana, they have created a cost calculator that will calculate your costs of leaving a tree, cutting a tree, treating your tree with insecticide. And um, it, he had a lot of factors in there. And I'll give you the link, or I'll give you the name of that webinar in a minute. But basically when it comes down to insecticide options, there's kind of three groups of insecticides. And if you look at this picture on the right-hand side, insecticides definitely work. Um, those of you who are in areas that have low populations of emerald ash borer, you can get 
you can stretch them out and it's not as expensive. Um, those of you who have higher populations of emerald ash borer and still have healthy trees, it's a, a really great way to protect individual trees. The tree in the foreground here has not been treated and those trees in the, in the background, the two trees down the street, are ash that have been treated. So definitely something that's doable eventually as EAB populations start to crash, you can, in those areas where emerald ash borer populations are high, once it starts to crash, you can start stretching out your timing and um, add another year until you have to retreat these trees. So your three options, um, any of you who have ever done any work with hemlock woolly adelgid, the first two here would be familiar to you, the dinotifuran as a bark spray and the imidacloprid as a soil drench or soil injection. Um, both of those are neonicotinoids, and I'll just leave that there. And if we want to have a discussion about neonicotinoids, we can. Ash trees are wind populated, um, I mean, are wind pollinated. So we do not have them visit uh, our pollinators visiting ash trees. They may be visiting something that's planted underneath the ash tree. So you, that's up to you to decide. Um, the imidacloprid soil drench or injection is super easy for an individual landowner to do a homeowner to do on a tree in their yard. There's no special equipment needed. It costs about 30 to $40 for a 10 inch diameter tree. And the only thing about this is that it needs to be done every year, especially in those areas that have high populations of emerald ash borer. The one that is the best, but probably a little bit more expensive and requires the equipment of a tree injector is the emamectin benzoate. It's um, been found that it lasts now up to three years, even in, they originally said two, but in areas, um, even with high populations of emerald ash borer, they say that it, it lasts about three years. And um, they say that it costs, I had it written here, and this will definitely vary from place to place. I think it's about $10 an inch of DBH and you'd have to retreat it every three years. Um, you may have to hire a tree service to do that um, because they have the special injectors. What happens is instead of going into the soil, you're injecting it directly into the tree and it's taking it up. These insecticides are gonna work kind of twofold. One, if you get them in right as the, they're, the tr ash trees are leafing out and as the adult beetles are emerging, the adult beetles are going to be eating the foliage and there will be some insecticide in the foliage. So we're gonna reduce the number of adult beetles out there that are laying eggs. And then the other thing is it does get taken into the phloem of the tree. And as the larvae feed under the bark, they will also die. So there's a twofold process that the insecticide is, is doing there. Oops. This is a guide that's on that emeraldashborer.info website. It has all of this information, lays everything out with the rates the second edition was updated in 2017, and they said that this third edition will be updated in April of 2019. So they have been doing this research for between 10 and 15 years now, and they learn have learned so much more since they first started, thinking that the insecticides were only good for a year, and now we can say they can move to three years. So that really helps somebody's budget a lot when you think of it in those terms. Um, so reading this updated information is going to be great. Um, the other thing I talked about was that webinar, and it was given from a man from Purdue. I think his name was Cliff something. Uh, if you go to emeraldashborer.info and go to EAB University, the name of the webinar, it was in February, and it was called Practical EAB Management, and he gave a lot of great information on what municipalities can do and individual landowners can do and the updated information on those insecticide treatments. So that's the majority of my talk. Um, we have gotten all of our funding for Emerald Ash Borer through USDA APHIS. We have worked very closely with our Georgia Department of Agriculture on this. And then there's tons of information on Emerald Ash Borer at emeraldashborer.info and that gainvasives.org. So that's it. I'd be happy to answer any of y'all's questions. If you have something that you would rather write, my email is there and that is my cell phone number. Thank you so much. That was great. 
Um, if anyone has any questions, now would be the time to type those in for us. Surely there's a question somewhere. While I'm looking for one, I'm gonna go ahead and um, launch a poll. If y'all wouldn't mind, takes about two seconds. So we have a question from Diane Simmons. She says, how was Emerald Ash Borer introduced to the United States again? Um, they think that it was brought over in some sort of wood packing material. And when we say wood packing material, we mean um, like pallets or the wood spools that electrical wire come on, large things that could possibly have the bark left on. And um, if a bark is left on any of those pieces of pallets, then if there were larvae underneath or pupae underneath those and they moved them from place to place and then it became the right temperature, then they emerge. Um, when you look at regulations now, anything shipped overseas, both from US to other countries or from other countries into the US, solid wood packing material is supposed to be treated. And usually that means heat treated um, there is a chemical way to do it, but 95% of them are heat treated and that wood packing material should have a stamp on it for its country of origin and how it was treated. So heat treating not only kills any of the insects that could possibly in there, but it also dries out the wood um, enough that there's not anything for the insects to feed on. Okay, let's see. Are the parasitoids single host only, only attacking the emerald ash borer? Yes, uh, everything that goes through USDA APHIS um, for certification for biocontrol goes through, I think it's like a five-year process to see and make sure that it is only host-specific. Let's see. Are stressed ash trees more susceptible to the insect? And how is the emerald ash borer attracted to an ash tree? Do they like older ones or... Are older trees more susceptible than younger trees? Um, no, emerald ash borer will attack any trees greater than, I believe it's either one or two inch in diameter. So smaller trees, there has to be enough wood material under the bark for the larvae to feed in. So that's why there's this, you know, the small diameter size that, you know, they have to be larger than. Uh, as far as I know, they do not differentiate between healthy versus stressed trees and most insects are usually attracted from tree to tree or insect to insect by pheromones which are scents but most of the research on emerald ash borer shows that they find their trees by visual cues that ash tree leaves are a specific color spectrum and that's what they look for but when we do the trapping um, we do use a pheromone for the trapping also okay um can these insects attack other types of trees? So there is some research going on about that right now. Um, ash trees are in the olive family, and that's why fringe, that white fringe tree is um, in the olive family closely related to ash trees. And that research has said that they can survive and reproduce in white fringe trees, whether or not they really want to attack a white fringe tree, probably, they don't, but in areas where they have lost 99% of their ash trees, fringe tree might be what is left. And um, so they are finding them there and reproducing there and they have done a lot of lab studies and I believe it's Ohio on that. And they're starting to look and do some research onto whether or not they can survive and reproduce in other trees in the olive family, one being like the true olive tree that's a crop species uh, and seeing if it, it you know, it, if it's possible that if emerald ash borer were to make its way to the Mediterranean region where they have that as an economic value to the region, if it could be a problem. What they are doing is lab testing and it's basically just seeing if they can survive in the wood of those species, not necessarily that they would find them in the wild and want to use them. So we're still a little ways off to know what other species they could possibly be attacking. Okay. 
are the emerald ash borers adapting to the climates they are being introduced to or will they die off in certain weather? Um, there's a lot of talk about that this year and last year with polar vortexes and um, if you look at the the range of of ash trees where it comes from in Russia, China, Japan, Asia, uh, there's a pretty wide range. Uh, that's why I said to, going back to biocontrol, they're looking at some more southern species. There's a pretty big range of, of weather in, in, in those areas. Uh, as far as the polar vortex affecting them, yes, it could positively knock back the populations, but <clears throat> I think I read that the weather the temperature under the bark of the tree, which is a very good insulator, has to be less than minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit for 48 hours um, in order to kill an EAB that's overwintering. So there may be very few parts of the US that that happens, um, not gonna happen in the Southeast. So even if the Northern populations were to die off, there's always gonna be a strong Southern population that will be migrating back to the North. Thank you. Let's see, we've, we've got time for a couple more. Okay, so this is asking about junipers. As, these, as, ugh, as the insect moves towards Texas and into Texas, will they have an impact on junipers, specifically uh, Judge Nipperus ashii? That's what they're asking about. I do not know what family of trees juniper is in. If it's in the olive family, then I guess it's possible but I don't think the junipers are in the olive family. They are not. Okay, there you go. Okay. Is the firewood restriction at campgrounds nationwide? Uh, it should be. I know Georgia State, Georgia State Parks do not allow people to bring in their own firewood. They have to buy firewood on site. And um, I don't, I think national campgrounds are the same way. But other than that, each state would have their own restrictions. Are the cold spells in Iowa and Wisconsin killing any of the emerald ash borers? So we talked about that and I said minus 15 degrees for more than 48 hours and that's not outside temperature. That would have to be the temperature of the, um, the sap wood under the bark of the tree, which is in a large um, mature tree is thick and a very good insulator. So it's possible, but not probable. It would probably do me in. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> so this question I think is saying how much ash is in um, southeastern United States home landscapes? Um, planted in urban areas, I think it's it's less than a quarter of the street trees are probably ash trees, uh, pr not used as much in the Southeast as it was in the Northeast and Central US, but there is some out there, definitely. Let's see, if you have a single healthy ash tree with no other ash trees around, do you need to treat it? Um, I would be aware of where emerald ash borer is in your location. And if you start to see any decline in your tree, I would start treating it with insecticide if it's something that you wanna protect. And the beauty of having other, no other ash trees around is that that insecticide treatment, you should be able to stretch, you know, a year or two longer than what the research says. Awesome. And is there anything the average person can do through their legislatures to get the camp wood ban put in place? I'm assuming it, they mean if it is not. Yeah, like I said, I don't know other states' regulations. Um, I do know that across the Southeast in the last 10 years, there's been a huge, um, and, and really it's nationwide, through you know groups like Forest Service and Nature Conservancy, and there was a large um, movement of Don't Move Firewood and a huge education program and uh, with these quarantine regulations, there's a lot of regulation put on firewood, especially anything that's bagged that you find and buy at the store should have a certificate on it that says it's pest free and has a USDA certificate number on it. So it's gonna be the individual homeowners, but there has been such a big push 
in the last decade with the Don't Move Firewood campaign that I hope most people have seen it and understand it with billboards and, and things posted at campgrounds and ranger talks and things like that. Super, and then we've got the same question from two different people in two different places. So are there species of ash that are more susceptible than other species? To the so in the United States, we have seven species of ash trees, all native North American ash, which would mean U.S. Can and Canada, is susceptible to, Amer to emerald ash borer. Those um, species that are from China, Russia, Asia, I think it's Manchurian ash is one that was actually used a lot in landscapes, does have some resistance to emerald ash borer. So, but then again, you're bringing in a non-native plant and does it fit in the landscape? Would you be better off just planting something else that's native that doesn't have a pest for it yet? Great, thank you. So are there any more questions before we wrap up? Okay, well, hey, thank you so much for being here with us today. That was a super great session and the, I learned a whole lot. So thank you. And for everybody else out there, maybe you would like to join us in April for our next webinar. It will be on snake identification and environmental importance. So any questions? This is before we log off. Ms. Womack, uh, Georgia Forestry Commission Forest Health Specialist, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, and thank you for all of your questions. Y'all have a great weekend.